Hello everyone, today we're going to be going over a patient who has abdominal pain. We're going to go through the exam that we would do for the abdomen itself and some of the important history questions. So first thing we'll do is talking with our patient, we want to ask about when this pain started, if they're having any fevers or chills, any nausea, vomiting, diarrhea is another important question. Then we want to get a history on how this pain actually started, where it is in their abdomen, where it's localizing to, <coughs> And if there's had any change to the quality, is it sharp? Does it radiate? Is it dull? Is it a burning feeling? If they notice it's associated with anything like meals. So there's many questions, but we'll get into more of that later. For now, we're going to get into the exam with our patient here. Now, since we're starting with an abdominal exam, I'm going to ask you to lay down first, please. Now, the important thing to remember with our patient here, of course, is that they're uncomfortable. So we always want to do the area that's bothering them last. Um, that's for the palpation, but in abdominal exams, we want to go in a specific order because we don't want to disrupt the bowel sounds if that's something that we're looking for, considering things like a small bowel obstruction. So the first thing that we're always going to do is auscultation in all four quadrants, and I actually like to make it into six quadrants so that we're dividing the abdomen equally. Then we'll go through percussion, which can help us determine gas patterns and where organs lie within the abdomen. And then finally, we'll go into palpation, and our fourth item are special tests. So let's get started with our auscultation. We'll start here in the right upper quadrant. And now I've already heard bowel sounds, but to be thorough in a patient where you don't hear bowel sounds, you actually need to listen for at least two minutes. Now we'll move to my central quadrant here. And you can stick with just four if you'd like, but I think that's helpful. And then we'll kind of move over here. And you'll just hear that grumbling. That's a typical abdominal finding for bowel sounds. We're in the lower left quadrant. Our patient's having pain in the right lower quadrant, so we're just going to gently rest the stethoscope here. And then, of course, that central quadrant central lower like we spoke about. Now in that area you can actually hear a pulsation and that's because the large aorta passes through the abdomen there. So what we're going to do now is percussion and we'll return when our patient is changed and comfortable. Now that our patient is changed and comfortable we're going to do percussion of the abdomen. We're going to start here in the right upper quadrant, and again, we're always going away from the pain. So we'll place our fingers down, and the technique of percussion requires some practice, but we're essentially bouncing our fingers off the top of our nail bed or finger here to kind of do a drum or percussion-like noise on the patient's abdomen. And so we can do that to find the liver border. And so in this patient, the border of the liver is above the rib cage, so we're not likely going to be able to locate it. And you can tell because there's no change in the percussion sound there. So I like to go all the way down, but since this patient is having pain in the right lower quadrant, we'll do that last. We'll go to the left upper quadrant. So you can hear that's a different sound. So there's less resonance there, so there's likely either substance in the stomach, or this may in fact be the spleen, although we're a bit anterior for that. And then we'll kind of come last towards the area of discomfort, and the patient's doing okay with that. And then again, you can hear the difference there compared to here. So there's very little resonance here. We have much more resonance here and then in the center. No change there as well. So normally we would percuss out borders, but again, in this patient, we don't have much borders to percuss because of the location of this patient's organs. So we're going to go ahead and get into our next component, which is going to be the actual palpation portion of the exam. So for palpation, we always go light to deep, and I'll show you what I mean with that. So on the abdomen here, I'm gonna come around the other side so that you can see better. 
from this side, uh, you'll be able to see a bit better here. So we'll start in the right upper quadrant, and what I like to do is just palpate light in circles, and then palpate gradually deeper. And what that does is both gives the patient comfort uh, in the pressure that you're placing, but it also lets you go through the different layers of tissue and see if you're finding any abnormalities. So I kind of do a couple palpations in each quadrant, and I just go light to deep. And so you can feel right through the muscle layer and down towards the abdomen. We don't feel any abnormalities and our patient's not having any discomfort. Now for this, I add extra quadrants and part of the exam. So I'll do an epigastric portion here to see if there's any discomfort. Could be signs of reflux. And then of course, a right upper quadrant. I'm sorry, a left upper quadrant here. Kind of coming into the periumbilical area, seeing if there's any tenderness or pain in there all the way towards the lateral, left lateral area here, and working our way down. And there's nothing down here. Oftentimes in the left lower quadrant, you'll find pain associated with things like diverticulitis. You don't see anything there. We'll come to the suprapubic area. This can be bladder, UTI, cystitis type symptoms. You can feel tenderness there. And then our patient is having pain, and you can see a grimacing response there. So we don't want to press too deep, but again, we'll go light to deep, and there's some significant discomfort there. Now. After this, we have our, our pain localized, which is exactly where our patient's reporting pain. The right lower quadrant oftentimes can be an appendix or appendicitis, uh, but there are many other things that live there. And so we try to do some special tests to figure those things out. Now, one of the first special tests that we'll do actually is not related to the right lower quadrant at all, but the right upper quadrant. And that's known as a Murphy's sign. You may have also heard of a sonographic Murphy's, which is just demonstrating this sound with ultrasound. So we'll do it with our hand first. We try to find the edge of the liver as we already did with percussion on our patient, but it was a bit far down. So we'll go the best place that we can at the border of the ribs. We'll hook our hands under here. Now, what's going to happen next is I'll say, please take a deep breath. Our patient's able to do that freely, and then you can release without any discomfort. What happens as we take a deep breath is the liver expands down because of movement from the diaphragm, and that gallbladder that lives underneath the liver kicks out. If your hands are there pressing in deep, it's going to be uncomfortable for that gallbladder. It's going to hit off your hands and you'll see someone have what's known as an inspiratory halt. This is something many get wrong. It's not about the pain, it's about the respiratory halt. Now that will be a topic for another video, but it is a special test that you should be aware of. Now we'll move down to one of the most well-known special tests here, and that is the McBurney's point. McBurney's point can be a sign for appendicitis. It's technically two-thirds of the way between the umbilicus and the ASIS, or the anterior superior iliac spine. So we can measure that distance out, which comes to right around here. And in this patient, we see a small scar here, which is interesting. We'll have to ask the patient about their history later on. I would assume they may have had their appendix removed, but again, this is for practice purposes only. We're going to press in here, and we see the patient has pain, and when we let go, they have more pain. That is a sign of rebound tenderness, in the lower two-thirds over McBurney's point, which can signal an appendicitis. But to help us get more information, there's a few more special tests that we can do. The next special test is known as a Rovzing sign. It's where we're going to apply pressure and then release in a different area of the abdomen to see if that localizes to the area the patient is having pain. We'll do that now. We'll come to the left lower quadrant, which as you can see, pressing in does not cause much discomfort. But when I release, the patient complains of pain in the right lower quadrant. That rebound tenderness is a positive Rovzing sign and can indicate another concern that there may be appendicitis. Now with appendicitis, there is other concerns, such as a perforation. Now our patient had a soft abdomen. They were not what we would call peritonitic, which would be a rigid, firm, tense abdomen concerning for a perforation of hollow viscous. However, there are other conditions, such as a psoas abscess or some type of closer towards retroperitoneal abscess that we can worry about. One way to test for these is a psoas sign. Now the psoas sign is when you ask the patient to lift their leg against resistance. I'll demonstrate that now. We'll start on the side that's not bothering the patient. And again, if there's no abscess here, this shouldn't be too tender. However, if the appendix is laying right on the psoas, you may still have a positive psoas sign. So we'll place our hand here and have our patient lift the leg against resistance and no pain. Now when we check the other side here, we'll have the patient lift their leg, and again, no pain. So in this patient, it's either that there is no abscess, or if there is an appendicitis, that it's likely not resting against the psoas muscle. Now that we've done a thorough exam, 
we know a rough idea of what may be going on with this patient. That said, in somebody who's potentially going to be going to the operating room, it's important to do a thorough exam. So the next thing we'll do is have our patient sit back up and take a listen to the heart and lungs. Now that we have our patient in the seated position, we're going to have them remain shirtless so that we can have an accurate exam for auscultation. Again, we'll go ahead and activate the echo stethoscope for noise canceling benefits and take a listen to the heart and lungs. Now, as you could hear there, there's no evidence of murmurs, gallops, or rubs. Moving through the auscultation points, the aortic, pulmonic, herbs point, um, the tricuspid, and then the mitral. So we've listened to all of the areas of the heart for a complete cardiac exam, which is important if a patient's going to be having any type of surgical intervention. The next thing that comes with anesthesia is intubation. So we want to make sure that our patient is optimized and has clear lungs, or at least we know the status of their lungs. We'll listen on both the front and the back in four places on each. On the sides, we'll listen to one on each to get a full lung exam with 10 auscultation points. Deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. Very good. Deep breath into the nose and out through the mouth. Good, and then we'll come over here and compare that in through the nose, and out through the mouth. Good. Good, and now what I like to do is have the patient lift their arm up. Excellent, and we'll listen here, deep breath in, and out. Great, and we'll check on this side here. Deep breath in, and out. Excellent. Now we'll come around the back and get our posterior auscultation points. All right, we'll go ahead and auscultate those same four positions here, starting on the right. Deep breath in through your nose, and out through your mouth. Good. In through your nose, and out through your mouth. In through your nose, and out through your mouth. Great, and one more time. And out the mouth. Excellent. What we hear are clear lungs, with no wheezing and good air movement on both sides or bilaterally. Now, for our patient here, we're also going to send off some lab work. Appendicitis can often be reflected with a high white blood cell count, so a CBC can be helpful here. Any patient going to the operating room would benefit from having a chemistry as well to know where their electrolytes are. Of course, undergoing surgery, we'd want to know a type and screen in case they need any blood products, as well as coagulation factors for the surgeon. Now there's much more to a pre-op exam, and again, this is just an educational overview of some of the things you may want to be asking in these patients. I hope this exam was helpful, and thank you again to our patient today for your time during this exam. If you have any questions, drop them down in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our exams. We'll see you next time.